on World News Tonight. India celebrates. On 75 years of independence, PM Modi says India aims to become a developed nation in 25 years. Spiking threats. FBI and Secret Service beef up security as Trump rallies against the FBI. Rushdie awake. Author Simon Rushdie is up and speaking, but his family says his condition is still critical. And beautifying wreckage. Artists transform war zones in an effort to beautify those areas for people's spirits. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight this Monday night and we begin in neighboring India. Speaking from the 17th century Red Fort in Delhi as India celebrates its 75th year of independence from British colonial rule, PM Modi exhorted youths to aim big and give their best years for the cause of the country. India will aim to become a developed nation within 25 years, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said in a national address with policies to support domestic production in power, defence and digital technology. Many experts say India's economy could expand to become the world's third largest by 2050 after the United States and China, although per capita income currently around $2,100 may remain low compared to many countries. PM Modi also said that the country needs to fight the problem of corruption prevailing in the country. Countries like the United States already see India as a future challenger to China's dominating influence in Asia and beyond. U.S. President Joe Biden congratulated India for its National Day and said the United States and India were inseparable partners that would continue to work together to address global challenges in the years ahead. Leaders of the United States and China could hold their first meetup at the G20 summit in November. When President Xi Jinping attends the event, it will be his first foreign trip in nearly three years since the COVID-19 outbreak. This comes as growing bilateral tensions over Taiwan comes. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping will likely meet in person in mid-November. That's according to the Wall Street Journal on Friday. It'll be the first face-to-face -face meeting as the leaders have only talked on the phone since Biden took office in January last year. The leaders' meeting is expected to occur at the G20 summit, which will be held on the Indonesian island of Pali. At the same time, this will mark Xi's first foreign trip in nearly three years since the COVID-19 outbreak. The planning of the trip comes amid Xi's efforts to enhance China's global influence in Southeast Asia. Regarding the matter, the White House did not give the meeting details. Discussed a possible face-to-face -face meeting uh, during their recent call and agreed to have their teams um, uh, follow up to sort out the specifics. Um, we don't have anything further in terms of details on time or location. Meanwhile, the G20 summit will be held after China's 20th Party Congress, where she is expected to claim his third term as Communist Party chief. The U.S. midterm elections will already have been held at this point as well. Due to the escalating conflict between the two countries over Taiwan, the meeting is significant. The two leaders are expected to discuss various issues regarding the Indo-Pacific region and the supply chains of semiconductors. A new warning in the United States serving as a vivid illustration of a divided nation on edge, with the FBI in a new bulletin described as spike in threats against law enforcement ever since that search in former U.S. President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Tonight, an alarming new warning sent to law enforcement about their own safety. Volatile fallout after some angry reactions to the court-approved search of former President Donald Trump's Florida estate Monday. A five-page joint intelligence bulletin states the FBI and DHS are aware of an increase in recent threats and calls for violence against federal law enforcement, U.S. government and judicial personnel in reaction to the FBI execution of a search warrant in Palm Beach, Florida on 8 August 2022. Federal sources say the bulletin does not name Mr. Trump or any targeted officials, but warns that their families could also be at risk. These threats are occurring primarily online and across multiple platforms. 
Secret Service says it's hardening security at its posts and locations like the White House. FBI headquarters and field offices are taking steps as well. Today, the former president, on his social media, accused the FBI and Department of Justice of acting with political motives. It is also out of control, great simmering anger. Tonight, former National Security Advisor John Bolton disputes an explanation Mr. Trump offered after the search removed 11 sets of classified materials. It was all declassified, he wrote. I think that claim is uh, almost certainly a lie. Bolton says he knew of no standing order to declassify materials the president wanted to keep. It would have to be documented what they were, each document, so that people would know what had been declassified. And I know of no logistical train, no paper train at all, that, that says what's declassified and what's not. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine entering its sixth month, some fear that the long-term result will be an environmental disaster. These divers are demining experts, searching a river in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces took back the Sumy region from Russian forces in April, but four months on, cannon shells are still being fished out in its waters. Ukraine's environment ministry estimates it'll take at least a decade to clear all the mines and explosives from the country. And there are fears long-term war could mean an environmental disaster, leaving Ukraine's waters contaminated for years to come. Denis Monastirsky is Ukraine's interior minister. It is known that water demining will go on for years. It is the area where we have a lot of work to do. We estimate the work that has to be done to demine Ukraine's waters will take at least five to seven years. Why? Because it's the most difficult type of demining. Ukraine's emergency service in June said more than 239 square miles of land littered with thousands of explosives had been cleared. But nearly 160,000 square miles are still seen as contaminated. Sofia Sadagurska at the Center for Environmental Initiatives warns that the efforts to remove the unexploded devices may not be enough to protect the ecosystem and human health. These territories are affected not just by mining itself, but also by um, heavy pollution from explosions and from rockets and from the moving of the, for example, uh, military troops. So to just remove mines on these territories will not be enough to restore all this unique ecosystem. An estimated 27 percent of Ukraine's land needs demining. Last week, the U.S. government approved $89 million in funding to help in the efforts. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, a funeral was held at a cemetery in Egypt's second largest city, Giza, for the victims of an electrical fire that swept through a Coptic Christian church during mass, causing a stampede and killing at least 41 people, most of them children and many suffering from smoke inhalation. Dozens of victims of a church fire in Egypt killed during Sunday mass were laid to rest hours later. Over 40 lives were lost in the blaze. Sources say they were mostly children. Relatives of the fallen attended a mass funeral in Egypt's second largest city of Giza. Coffins were passed through the church so that families could grieve and pray for the deceased. About a thousand people had been gathered for Sunday mass at the Abu Sifin church when the fire began. Sources said the fire blocked an entrance to the church, causing a stampede. One of the injured, who only gave his name as Kyrillos, said they saved who they could. The fourth floor of the church was on fire. There were children in the nursery and there was a mass. We were fasting these days and soon there will be Eid. I don't know what happened. It was an electrical fire, but there were kids and elderly people. We saved who we could save. We looked up and saw a lot of black fumes in the air. The Interior Ministry said in a statement, a forensic examination showed the fire began in the second floor air conditioning as a result of an electrical malfunction. It also said that smoke inhalation was the main cause of death. It added that the victims' families would receive about $5,000 each in compensation. 
Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi also offered his condolences in a tweet. Electrical fires are not uncommon in Egypt. In late 2020, at least seven people were killed in a hospital fire. The Taliban marked the first anniversary of their return to power in Afghanistan with a national holiday, following a turbulent year that saw women's rights crushed and humanitarian crises worsen. An image seen the world over as thousands attempted to flee Kabul and the advancing Taliban. 24 hours earlier, the city was taken. President Hani fled and an interim government led by the Taliban was announced. Just six weeks previous, 60 kilometers away from Kabul at Bagram airfield, thousands of US troops left the base overnight, giving no warning to their Afghan colleagues. According to Joe Biden, the Afghans would need to now do it themselves. I am concerned that they deal with the internal issues that they have to be able to generate the kind of support they need nationwide to maintain the government. But the Afghans are going to have to be able to do it themselves with the air force they have, which are helping them maintain. At one time, the largest U.S. base in the country, Bagram was suddenly a ghost town. Many feared that the mass withdrawal would be a catalyst for the quick advance of the Taliban. Those fears were proved correct, as July saw advances move quicker than expected. 64 districts were seized from the Afghan government in one month alone. The Taliban entered Afghanistan's second city, Kandahar, on the 9th of July, and 19 days later, they did the same in the country's third largest, Herat. The beginning of August saw several high-profile killings carried out by the Taliban as they continued their march through the country. U.S. officials warned that Kabul could be taken within 90 days, although President Hani remained defiant. It is an obvious necessity to have national security alongside the police and national forces. I have guided the defense ministry to take full responsibility for the security of all residents. It is our responsibility, and it is a responsibility that, God willing, we will take on appropriately. In reality, Kabul fell sooner than anyone could have anticipated. On the 15th of August, the Taliban entered Kabul to little resistance. The city fell in a matter of hours rather than days. President Hani fled and the second reign of the Taliban began. I want to congratulate the Muslim Afghan people on this huge victory, especially the citizens and residents of Kabul. The battle wasn't over for the many who were attempting to leave the country. Kabul airport overcome with those desperate to escape. The situation led to one of the biggest airlifts in history, many countries evacuating their own citizens, amongst others. The US alone evacuated over 80,000 people over a period of 11 days. But for those who weren't lucky enough to get out, life under the Taliban had become a new reality. Now, since the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, the economy has spiraled into decline and families are increasingly reporting to sell their young girls into forced marriages. In a slum on the outskirts of Kabul, nearly 800 families live crammed in crumbling shelters, eking out an existence. As Afghanistan has slumped further into poverty, some here are taking heart-wrenching measures to survive. Fatima had to sell one of her three young children. We were hungry. We didn't have anything to eat. My elder daughter was admitted to a clinic for almost two or three months. I faced a lot of problems. That's the reason why I sold my daughter. Faroza is just three years old, but already her future is sealed. When she reaches age 10, she'll be forced to marry and leave the family home. My heart just can't accept this. How can I send this 10-year-old girl away to another house? For their child, Faroza's parents received 150,000 Afghanis, just over 1,600 euros. It was the hardest decision of my life. This was a huge decision I made. Instead of seeing them dead, I would rather see them alive. I had no choice but to sell my daughter. Her father used to work as a street seller, but says Taliban police destroyed his cart 
in a crackdown on unlicensed peddlers. And with Afghanistan's economy in crisis, many are struggling to find any work. They used to be daily workers, but now even those jobs don't exist anymore. We have people who want to kill themselves out of hunger and desperation. Some of them sold their kidneys, others are selling their children. There are so many people facing problems. Across the alley, we meet another mother in dire need. Her husband is out of work. She's no longer able to afford treatment for her disabled daughter, so she's selling her seven-year-old sister into marriage. We were poor before, but now inflation is hurting us poor people so much. If we don't sell her, what else can we do? They're not for sale, but we have no other way. Forced marriages have long existed in Afghanistan, but the phenomenon is getting greater since a year's time, since the Taliban took power and the Afghan economy all but collapsed, with more and more families being pushed into poverty and taking extreme measures to survive. Acclaimed author Salman Rushdie remains in critical condition but is showing signs of improvement. The 75-year-old was taken off the ventilator and was able to say a few words a day after he was repeatedly stabbed while giving a lecture on freedom of speech. Salman Rushdie's agent on Sunday said the acclaimed author was off a ventilator and that his condition is improving after an attacker repeatedly stabbed him at an event in New York State. In an email, Rushdie's agent said, quote, he's off the ventilator, so the road to recovery has begun. It will be long, the injuries are severe, but his condition is headed in the right direction. After being airlifted to a hospital in Erie, Pennsylvania, Rushdie was put on a ventilator following hours of surgery and was unable to speak as of Friday evening. Rushdie's agent also said the 75-year-old would likely lose an eye and had nerve damage in his arm and wounds to his liver. Rushdie was set to deliver a lecture on artistic freedom in western New York when police say a man rushed the stage and stabbed him. The suspect, 24-year-old Hadi Matar of Fairview, New Jersey, pleaded not guilty to charges of attempted murder and assault at a court appearance on Saturday. Rushdie, who was born into an Indian Muslim family, has lived with a bounty on his head since 1989 when the supreme leader of Iran urged Muslims to kill him over his novel The Satanic Verses which some Muslims said contained blasphemous passages. Authorities in Iran have made no public comment about the attack, but hardline state media outlets have celebrated the stabbing, with headlines including Satan has been blinded, and some Iranians voiced support online for the stabbing. However, many other Iranians expressed their sympathies for Rushdie, posting on social media about their anger at the Islamic Republic's clerical rulers. In a statement posted on Twitter, one of Rushdie's sons said his father was able to say a few words after getting off the ventilator, adding, quote, though his life-changing injuries are severe, his usual feisty and defiant sense of humor remains intact. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. There was heavy rain overnight in South Korea's Xinjiang Namdo province, which flooded buildings and roads. The counties of Xinjiang and Biu were both over 170 millimeters of rain. A gunman wounded seven people aboard a bus carrying Jewish worshippers in the old city of Jerusalem. The suspect later turned himself into police and the weapon he carried with him was seized. A U.S. congressional delegation arrived in Taiwan less than two weeks after a visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The five members will discuss issues including regional security, trade and investment. Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said that he had sought legal advice from the country's Solicitor General following reports that his predecessor, Scott Morrison, was secretly appointed to key ministerial roles during the COVID-19 pandemic, duplicating some portfolios. Washington, D.C. law enforcement is on high alert as Capitol Police say that 29-year-old Delaware resident Richard York killed himself after plowing his car into a Capitol barricade. After the car caught on fire, the driver started firing a handgun into the air as he walked down a block towards the Capitol.
And that's all the news from us from World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we'll leave you tonight with artists from Ukraine and the US transforming a heap of burnt-out cars destroyed in the early days of Russia's war in Ukraine with brilliant sunflowers. Stay safe and have a good night.